All right, everybody, grab your chairs. We're ready to go. I knew better than you. We've decided that the agenda was not long enough tonight, so we're adding two more items to it. We'll be here till midnight. Oh. Connie will be baking cookies later. I'm leaving. Oh, okay. At this time, I would like to call the December 19th, 2018 Board of Directors meeting for Dr. Cog to the final meeting of the year. Yeah, I mean, darn. Yeah, it'd be quiet down there. At this time, uh, I ask you all, please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, Miss Garcia, just go through the list and see who's here. Eva Henry, Steve Odoricio, Jeff Baker, Bill Holland. Here. Lise Jones. David Beacom. Here. Andy Wheelock. Here. Nicholas Williams. Kevin Flynn. Here. Roger Partridge. Here. John Angles. Libby Zabo. Bob Pfeiffer. John Marriott. Bob Roth. Terry Vidham, Here. David Bellman, Aaron Brockett, Here. Margo Ramsden, Baca, Here. Roger Hudson, Price, George Teal, Tammy Maurer, Catherine Heider, Laura Christman, Paul Holland, Paul Christie. I saw Rick here. Where are you at, Rick? Rick, I'm here. Thank okay. you. <laughs> <laughs> Debbie Nasta, Catherine Whitman, Steve Conklin, Linda Olson, Cheryl Wink, Bill Gipp, Daniel Dick, Bobby Sindelar, Lisa Jones, Laura Brown, Lynette Kelsey, Scott Norquist, Tim Dale, here. John Rickhouse, Stephanie Walton, Wine, Jacob LeVure, Gary Bean, Isaac Levy, Gary Strock, John Peck, Marsha Martin, Connie Sullivan, Arnie Drystadt, Joyce Palazuski, Paul Sutton, Gray, John Dyack, Kelly Daigle, Berta Mooney, Andy Hammerly, Jessica Sand, Batchison, here. Bud Starker, here. Adam Zarin, Deborah Perkins Smith, Paul Van Meter, here. Okay, we have a quorum. So, some announcements for some welcoming, and then also announcement for some farewells. Starting uh, tonight, this was the to be the last meeting of the year for us. We would have been uh, saying to two of our members, Laura Christman, currently the mayor of uh, Cherry Hills, and then Tina Francone from Jefferson County. This would have been their last meeting, but neither are here tonight, so we wish them and thank them very much for the service they've done for Dr. Cog and the groups that they represent. And then we'd like to welcome some new members. Jason Gray, the mayor of Castle Rock, will be the new member. He's here serving George tonight. Uh, he's gotten him coffee, all the rest of the things. By the way, George likes his without cream and sugar, Mayor. And you are the new alternate for Castle Rock. Larry Strock, trustee of Lock Bowie, is the new member, previously the alternate. Larry got promoted. Julie Duran Mullica, council member of North Glen, is the new member, previously the alternate. And Joyce Downing. Some of you may have a fond recollection that she's been around about 50 years. She's still here. <laughs> and Joyce is almost as old as I am. <laughs> Joyce is the new alternate for the city of North Glen. And Sandy Hammerly, trustee of Superior, is the new members representing them. So welcome all of our new members. So a couple of other short things before we get into the agenda. We'd like to also welcome the new mayor pro tem of the city of Aurora, Mr. Bob Roth. Now we will also have a, a an announcement to the uh, Drawing was held earlier. I know this is a piece that you all look forward to very much to find out who's next on the hot seat. Well, Mr. Starker, congratulations. The city of Wheat Ridge is up next. 
And uh, we do appreciate donuts and stuff like that at these meetings anytime you'd like to bring them. So tonight we have uh, on the agenda. So unfortunately, I know you, you will be remiss in understanding that the presentation on water and growth dialogue, unfortunately our speaker was not able to make it tonight, so your agenda just got about an hour shorter. Hey. <laughs> add, add to it, but I don't think you want to do that. So uh, to move forward, I also need to have a uh, motion to approve the agenda for tonight. I have second. a second. Of all those in favor, aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, motion is carried. <coughs> Moving like this, we might go home by seven. <laughs> Uh, there was uh, RTC didn't have a meeting. Yeah, there was no RTC meeting, so I can get rid of that one. Mr. Dyack, performance and engagement? No meeting, sir. Oh, my goodness. Here we go again. Finance and budget. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The Finance and Budget Committee met this evening. Um, we were very encouraged and happy that RTD accepted grant for Vanpool program, so we're able to fund the Vanpool program. And we approved that tonight, and we also um, negotiated for some software that's critical to our accounting function, so we're happy to approve both of those things. Hey. Mr. Rex. Okay, that was good. Thank you. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> wait, wait. I got a couple things. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a couple things. First of all, um, so our January board work session uh, is scheduled for January 2nd. Again, that's January 2nd, the day after January 1st. Um, and I anticipate it's probably not going to be the best, best uh, attendance at that meeting. Quite frankly, we, uh, we don't have anything pressing. So we're going to go ahead and cancel that work session. Um, so my question is for, don't get too excited, P&E members. Um, for those that are on p and &E, I'm going to throw it out there. Uh, the chairman and I, we talked about this, committee chair, about uh, your desire to have a meeting in January. I'm going to be here, but, uh, but if, you know, if, you, if you want to have a meeting on, on, uh, on January 2nd, we can definitely do that, or we can uh, just reconvene in February. Mr. Chair, is there... Uh Anything pressing on the agenda that should not be moved to February? Uh, well, I, I think this January 2nd, we should have the meeting at Doug's house and we should prime rib with an open bar, I believe, would be appropriate. I think P&E just decided to have yeah. a meeting. Second. Yeah, second. I, I, I hear a second there. but um, We'll wait till February. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, yes, yeah, so P&E will be canceled for at the January meeting as well. Um, Award celebration, you're going to hear me keep talking about this and probably until April. Um, the award celebration is scheduled for Wednesday, April 10th at the Higher Regency downtown. Um, the nominations are, are, we are accepting nominations for the various awards. Please, you have a flyer at your table and please give that some careful consideration because I know there's lots of folks out there that um, we would like to acknowledge as part of the great work they do within this region. So please give that some thought. Um, the last thing, well, two, two more things I would like to mention. First, we're working on a public engagement plan right now. Uh, it's an update. We're federally required to have a public engagement plan. This one we've been working on, my notes say six months, but I know it's been at least a year that we've been working on this. Um, and it's a much more robust plan than anything we've ever had. We are specifically required to have a, a uh, public engagement plan for the MPO functions, the transportation functions, but this, this engagement plan is for the entire agency and all the programs underneath it. So we just felt that um, you know, we, you know, we wanted to uh, be kind of a trendsetter in this respect for, for all of our councils of governments across the country. And I think it's what I've seen thus far I've been very happy with. Our plan is um, to release this sometime in January. It does require a 45-day public comment period, so you'll, you'll probably see it in the January meeting for, uh, for, for just discussion purposes. But ultimately, there will be a public hearing and, and uh, ultimate approval sometime later in the spring. Um, the other thing I would like to mention is we did, we were recipients of a couple of awards since the last time uh, we met, and um, I... <laughs> I don't know exactly the names of the of the, the awards. I do know we did receive one from the Colorado Business Roundtable, and we're recognized at a luncheon um, a couple weeks back, and that was the Champions of Industry Award. So we were all <laughs> present to 
Yeah, right. It's, <laughs> it's the second year in a row we've won that award. We received it the year prior for our Bike to Work Day activities. Is that right, Steve? Oh, I'm sorry. Gotcha. And then um, the other one, we received one from the um, Gerontological Society, uh, and that was basically for our 40 plus years of service to this region. Um, that, was, that was actually, I, I really enjoyed that, that, um, that, that reception. It was pretty cool. It was at a nursing home um, within the region. It was actually in Aurora. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was a great environment. Was, I think the people there were very appreciative of the work that you know, Jayla and her folks do. So they're both on the AAA side and, and uh, just speaks to the tremendous work that Jayla and all her staff does. So thank you, Jayla. Mr. Chairman, I'm done. Moving on to the next item is public comment. Up to 45 minutes is allocated now for public comment, and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are any additional requests for public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete public comment. The chair requests that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before this board. Consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. Do we have a speaker tonight? We have one item. Go ahead, sir. Randall Loeb from Denver. Uh, good evening. Uh, happy holiday. May it be a peaceful and uh, with great exodus uh, new year. Uh, I have the unfailing requirement to share with you the eulogy uh, which I gave tonight to the secretary of the board regarding a hero's journey which will be read as a eulogy on Friday night at 530 at the city and county building for the entire region actually more than 250 names of people who had been homeless at some point. And an escalating issue I've been involved with for more than 20 years. In 1999, as I've mentioned before, uh, seven men were murdered uh, where the Union Station hub is at the moment. And uh, I was on the street at the time. And they solved one of those murders. Of course, according to the investigator, he said they were all seven were created by the same group, but there was no ever proof of that, even though I believe he knows what he's talking about. Uh, in any case, tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. At, at the United Way, um, there will be a, uh, uh, for the Metro Denver Homeless Initiative, the seven county continuum of care, a stakeholder meeting. And I'm hoping representatives come from more than those seven counties because I believe, as I've said to the council that I serve on of the, gut of the mayor, and I do have work with the governor, that if we don't work together across all lines to deal with this, that we're not going to get anywhere in ameliorating the problem that I started out with in the 1990s. And as an older man in my late 60s, I know that Housing has become more crinkly to get, and it's very clear to me that more of us are dying because of the addictions. Uh, I really hope that we can figure out a way to make it possible for more than accessory dwelling units, but to expand this. And I was part of the Tran Transit Alliance Academy. Um, graciously, you allowed me to participate. And I feel that we do not focus enough, as I told them in my evaluation, on poverty. And that we need to grapple with very seriously in this next year ahead. And I pray that at some point we can all grab our coats and go out there together to meet with those people and to make sure they're safe. Thank you. Any other comments? OK. Thank you, sir. Next item up is Mr. Jim Dale with the City of Golden. All right. Good evening, as we say on Buffalo Bill's days or every day, Jim Dale needs a microphone. Howdy, folks. <laughs> it is, it's great, although the chair told me as an award, but it is great to be here to 
shine a spotlight on Golden. So what I'd like to do tonight is talk a little bit about our city of Golden, talk about how we came up with the vision we have and, and discuss it briefly, and then how do we implement that vision? How do we get with, and the recognitions we've received and then trying to keep our eye on the ball? So we're an old city. We're the capital. Denver stole it, as you all know. And we're around 20,000 souls, and we have a 1% growth limit. We're a full-service city. We have fire. We have PD. We have water and sewer. We, we work with Coors on our sewage and uh, help them out and help us out. And we're only 10 square miles or so, and these are some of the amenities that we do have in our city, and we're very proud of them. This is our city council. You recognize many of them. Some of you will see uh, Casey Brown and Sertia, who are past members here, directors. Paul Hazeman, my alternate. And, of course, Mayor Marjorie Sloan. And, oh, went back one. And as you know, uh, and it's not showing that, huh? <coughs> as you know, Mayor Sloan is the chair of the Metro Mayor's Caucus, and we're proud of that. And... Councilor Laura Weinberg was recognized this year by the Jeffco Economic uh, Corporation, Development Corporation, as the elected official of the year, and it's my pleasure to sit next to Laura on council. But we can't do anything in the city unless these folks make it happen. On your left is Jason Swinsky. Jason came aboard two years ago, replacing the legend Mike Fester, and Jason has been working to add to his staff as people leave or retire. Uh, next to him there, we stole from Wheat Ridge, Carla Renz, uh, thank you, bud, uh, and she's our new deputy city manager. Uh, from up in northeast, we got Monica Mendoza as our new city clerk, replacing Susan Brooks, who had been there for almost 40 years at the clerk's office. And then you can go on across and See on the far end, Giles McCoy. We've changed from IT to innovation and enterprise, this type of a effort. So Giles spends a lot of his time dreaming about smart cities and things such as that. But our newest and latest uh, staff member is Chief Alicia Welch. Chief Welch came to us from L.A. with extensive experience as a battalion chief extensive experience in working FEMA exercises and real-time FEMA uh, initiatives, and Chief Welch is the first female fire chief in the metro region, and we're extremely proud of her. But we can't do any of these things with, without a good vision. So during the period about 2008 to 2010, we worked on Vision 2030. And this involved all kinds of neighborhood meetings and uh, big meetings and small meetings. And we brought this all together at the high school, came up with some commonalities. And first thing was, what are the principles that would guide us? And these were the things we came up with here. And then, what are the values that we should reflect on our decisions? And these are our community values. And you see everything from yeah, we're outdoors folks, we walk a lot, clear on down to our whole sense of community, and we don't make things out with, uh, happen without lots of volunteers. <coughs> so, with that in mind, how do we implement our vision? Well, the first thing is we want to be a great place to live, work, and play, and I believe we are, and we strive for that, because we're very proud of our schools, the museums and nonprofits that we have in our city, and we talk about and, and planning other efforts about a sense of place. And we think that we have many senses of place and destinations in our little city. And how can you talk about Golden if you don't talk about Coors and today microbrews and other places? So first, Colorado School Mines. We're very proud to have it be the home of Colorado School Mines and our high school, which is integral to the core of our city. So we see our high school kids walking around our city. We have a great middle school with a strong STEM program. We have two elementary schools, and we have charter schools. And education is a big part of our life. 
we are very proud of our museums, not only in Golden, but in the Greater Golden, like Buffalo Bill and the Train Museum. If you've, met the, if you've gone to those, you'd say, what a hoot. But across Golden, with our Foothills Art Gallery, our Quilt Museum, our History Museum, the American Mountaineering Center, and the Mountaineering uh, Museum. It's just a lot of fun, and that's not even talking about Miner's Alley Playhouse, which Luann and I enjoy immensely, but we like going to our friends in Arvada for their great productions, too. But we have a lot of places that people want to go, and I like to go to Fossil Trace there and try and hit around that chimney this young man is trying to hit there, uh, the splash, but also many people come to Golden to do business with the county, and we call it the Taj Mahal with the uh, kindness, and I was a county employee, so I say it with real kindness. It's amazing that the bridges we put in become a destination because we have a historical interpretive placards there, and people stop and read those placards and learn about, you know, go west, young man, go west, because he went across that creek there, and the community center and all the other great amenities. But we are very proud of our public art, and here's just a sampling. And the Golden Civic Foundation has been instrumental in uh, purchasing a lot of this. The one down on your lower lip is somewhat controversial. That's the Hummer, uh, a hummingbird made out of car hoods. It's kind of a cool thing. It's on the it's on the last circle on South Golden Road. Go see it. <coughs> and their checkmate, uh, a great uh, statue of that horse, and that went into our linking lookout. But how about Coors. We have over 300,000 people come to Golden every year to go to see Coors. And they come to Golden uh, after they visit, and it's great. But we've had an explosion. So Charlie Sturdivant started Golden City of Beer uh, a long time ago, but since that time, the last few years, we've added four more microbrews, and they're all busy. And now we've got two distilleries, and we even had a cidery that came in this year. So these things are big deals. But you got to be able to move people to get them in there. And so I want to thank all our partners. And it's you guys who made some of this moving of people possible. I told Bill I was going to mention RTD, RTD, RTD. And <laughs> Jeff Cole, thank you, Lizzie. And I don't even have to pay him. Commissioner Sable. And our great Jeff Cole from Space, because these things wouldn't happen without that because we have great places to walk to ride our bikes we have a bike library we've got a green bus we've got complete street circles we've even done some road diets and we're working towards smart city technology so that the lights will work for you instead of against you, you won't be sitting there idling idling Michael we're not going to be sitting there idling be like that so what are some of the key transportation efforts well the bridges these bridges were raised up out of the floodplain, so no longer will they be dams if we have those problems. I mentioned the road diets on Heritage Road and Ford, which are controversial, but people have slowed down. The kids have better, safer routes to school. Because of that, we have some raised sidewalks, and the parents just uh, talked to me about how important those are. And we added a new mobility and transportation advisory board to give us guidance on what they feel we should be strategically looking at, at what we should be looking, I guess, what to say. Now, here's a little bit of South Golden Road. There's a number of circles along there. We took out all those lights. And when you take out lights, you take out uh, less, you use less energy. And we had fewer accidents. And people are slowly learning. But most people my age still complaining, but slowly learning how to use circles. But it's really great. And South Golden Road with the circles is a complete street. Uh, we're very proud of this the linking lookout, the interchange over Highway 6 on 19th Street, and it got the American Public Works Association Award for Best Project in that category of 5 to $25 million. and it's quite a, quite a place because it's a park, too, and you can go sit there and meditate or do whatever. And the latest one that's going on even right now is our North Washington Complete Street Project, and it's really neat. They're laying asphalt today, yesterday. It's going to be partially open for Christmas, and all that part you see there from Iowa clearing out the 93 will be almost complete. And CDOT, thank you. Uh, 
uh, is helping us with that interchange there at 93 in Iowa, make that more walkable. You kind of look like you're from here to the back room, even though it wasn't that far to get across that that uh, so, that walk there. But they're helping us to make that more walkable, and that's really great. We also have three accredited departments. We're very proud of our police and our public works department. Needless to say, we're proud of Parks and Rec. And they were back in 2010 and have continued to be a gold medal winners. And we're really excited about that and the programs that provide. And you're looking down the 18th fairway there of, of Fossil Trace. With, I don't aim right when I, I'm on 18th tee. You know. Matter of fact, I always go into the tree well up there on the end of that hoop. As, as, we did, as we've done all these things in the city, as my colleagues really done them, the staff have done them, we want to make sure we keep our eye on the ball. Well, what's that about? Well, it's about sustaining the efforts of the city so we can be a more livable place. We're proud that we have a LEED certified building. We're proud of the people who work in community gardens and all the awards we receive. And I'm double proud because I came from sustainability board to council and planning commission before that. But there's many other things. And where a lot of people here think about water and we're we're focused on water, and we're focused on our reservoir at Empire. We're focused on how we can minimize impacts on climate change, the renewable energy efforts we have on top of our city buildings. Uh, we are focused on smart city work. We're glad to be collaborating with Excel. And if you watch the Public Utilities Commission, you know what I'm talking about. And in waste, we have a single hauler program on most of the city. We've got pay as you throw, and we have composting. We're hoping to expand that because our recyclables and our compost are resources. We want to conserve them. And being physically sound is terribly important to me and it's terribly important to our city. We're very proud of our city for doing this. We have a strong uh, reserve, as you can see, from general fund. As a matter of fact, back in 2008 and 9, 7, 8, and 9, when the recession hit us, our reserves helped us immensely to be able to do things and also gave us flexibility to buy the city annex about two years ago in December when it came for sale quickly we could we could work. I was pleased to work on the budget advisory committee for 17 years and we provide input to the city manager as Jason Swinsky takes and puts together his program and recommendations to the council. Well we can't do any of these things unless we're responsive to our citizens and we reach out to them so we have had many, many public meetings. We have some great publications. In your right-hand corner is the Golden Informer. It's a full monthly magazine that has editorials from the mayor or members of council and announcements about a lot of the projects we do. We have a weekly digest that goes out email. Social media, we're uh, very active on social media also. And then there's our new platform of Guiding Golden, where citizens can post things, where we have council connect, council can post things and people can read them and make comments. So we feel strongly about doing, being a responsive government and having that transparency. Well, that's kind of the roadmap I've laid out for you about Golden, where we came from as a capitalist Colorado, our vision, and then some of the programs of which we're proud. I want to thank Carl and Tilly, which we stole from Channel 4 here a few years back for being our communications manager, PIO, you name it, she does it, and she helped me with this presentation, and I was honored to give it. Thank you very much. Glad you got your work cut out for you. That's a tough act to follow, I'll tell you. Yeah. Glad it's you and not me. All right, next item on the agenda is to move to a approve the consent agenda of the minutes of the November 28th, but before you do that, there was uh, one revision that was made to the minutes on the transit asset management on page four was changed from Jacob Rieger to Matthew Helfont. That was the only change made to the minutes. So at this point, uh, the chair will accept a motion to approve the consent agenda. Okay, I got a motion and a second. All those in favor, aye. aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, it is approved. We'll move on to the next item on the action items. Item 11, 
Discussion on adding the 125,000 of STP Metro in FY 2019. Mr. Sports. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening. I'm Robert Spots, Transportation Planner here at Dr. Cog. I have the honor of being the first to introduce Mike Silverstein, the new Executive Director of the Regional Air Quality Council. Uh, he replaced Ken Lloyd after decades uh, in that role. Uh, the uh, Denver region had an interesting year in terms of ozone planning and regulations. We had a bad summer, um, followed by a court case. The RAC now has um, an immediate need for additional modeling um, in preparation for the new regulations that are going to be put on the region. Um, I'm going to introduce Mike Silverstein. He'll talk about, um, about the implications of those. But what we're asking for tonight is an advancement of funds in, um, from the future TIP into the current TIP, $125,000. And in, in the middle of a TIP, this would kind of just be an administrative modification, moving funds between years. But because this money is currently just a set aside in the draft TIP, um, we thought we'd run it by you guys for transparency. They're not asking for additional funds. This is just taking out $125,000 from the set aside already existing in the draft TIP and putting it into FY 2019. Um, here's Mike to tell you why the advance is necessary, and um, then we'll look for a motion. Thank you. Yes, good evening, and, and thank you very much, and thank you, Robert, for the, uh, the kind introduction. Um, I am not Amanda Brimmer. Uh, I, I have been duly scolded by staff for not getting my slides in on time um, uh, on the mailing date. So, what, uh, what was provided to you were, was a, a presentation that was provided um, to, uh, to previous uh, uh, working sessions uh, of Dr. Cog. And so I will go through the slide deck, talk about ozone, talk about the, the Regional Air Quality Council. I'll, I'll add a few other nuggets to this. I'll skip over some things that, I, that might not be uh, uh, necessary to, uh, to discuss with you all tonight. But uh, I'll begin. And if you have any questions, um, please. Uh, don't hesitate to, uh, to ask me as we're going through or, or at the end of the presentation. So thank you. And, and again, the, the ultimate ask here is for that, um, that advancement of $125,000 from uh, the draft tip um, beginning in 2020 into the, uh, the current tip that, uh, that we have. And I'll, and I'll explain the rationale for that. So uh, a little bit about ozone. Ozone is our summertime air pollutant that we um, do not comply with. There are national ambient air quality standards for a whole array of, of air pollutants. And uh, the Denver metro area and the North Front Range has had a history of noncompliance with, um, with most of those standards, ranging from carbon monoxide to fine particulates and, uh, and presently ozone. We've always had an ozone problem in the Front Range, and we've always made improvements. And as EPA does on occasion, they will ratchet the standard down. They'll tighten that standard as a health effects information uh, directs them to uh, uh, be protective of public health across the nation. It's one standard for the entire country, and we have a history of vegan noncompliance. So this graphic here goes back to 1998, and it is the, uh, the, the ozone levels that are monitored in the region. This is the highest value at the, at the, that the monitoring network records. Uh, and again, it's, uh, it's a standard that's based on uh, what's called the uh, the maximum uh, fourth uh, concentration averaged over a three-year period. So you get a few gimmies a year to determine whether you're in compliance or out of compliance with a federal standard. But those, even, a, even one high value is one high value too many. It's a public health issue. It's uh, damaging to our lungs, to our health of our children and the elderly. And so it's our job at the Regional Air Quality Council to work towards getting those values down into compliance with all standards and to be protective of public health and our environment. So we have three standards in recent time, a 1997 standard, which we've come into attainment of, which is great news. Uh, in 2008, um, the standard was lowered, and that's that kind of a, a mauvish colored uh, box there. And um, we are uh, still not attaining that standard, though we did have one year in, in uh, a previous summer that we did attain. So we're, we're getting closer, but we spiked back up above the standard this last summer. And, and we also have another standard that was adopted in 2015. Both the 2008 standard and 2015 standards are in place and we're required to develop air quality plans, reduce emissions, and reduce those ozone concentrations below the level of those standards. And so that's, that's the job of the Regional Air Quality Council. 
the, uh, the governor appoints our board. So we have, at this time, 24 board members. Um, Dr. Cog is represented on the board. Uh, CDOT's represented on the board, Department of Health and Environment, uh, mayors, council people, the automotive sector, industry, um, advocacy groups. We're, we're a, a broad organization with lots of representation to try to come up with strategies and, and approaches to um, show compliance. So we, um, we have the responsibility of meeting these air quality standards. Again, we've attained all of the air quality standards um, except for ozone, so that's great news. Uh, we were a state that um, violated all standards at one time, but we've, we've done much better, but ozone is our, is our problem area. So the RAC, what we do is we, um, we do outreach and education, convene stakeholders, develop proposals for, for other um, boards and commissions to consider. Uh, we don't have authority to implement regulations or adopt regulations, but we make those recommendations and hopefully those recommendations are, are accepted and, and then we move forward. We also implement measures that actually reduce emissions. We have a number of measures in the Regional Air Quality Council that we help fund or that we initiate ourselves that, that reduce emissions from the mobile source sector. So cars, trucks, heavy duty vehicles, construction equipment, et cetera, electric vehicle charging infrastructure. We do a lot at the Regional Air Quality Council to help us as a, as a region make progress to getting into compliance with ozone. So just another view of this, when we average those values that are peak values over one year at a time, we get a three-year average, and that's what really counts. That's what's kicking us out of compliance, and our, our current value is, is in the upper 70s, approaching 80. And so we're not, of course, in compliance with either of the standards in place. So just a little bit of graphics here. The, the monitoring sites up and down the Front Range, all the way from Fort Collins and out to Greeley, down through the metro area, up along the Front Range, out, of, out on the eastern side of Aurora, down into Douglas County. So we have lots of monitors out there, and many of those monitors, in fact, most of those monitors don't show attainment of the standards. So it's just, it's just not Denver Central problem. It's just not Fort Collins or Greeley or, or Douglas County. It's all of us, and so we all have difficulty um, getting values below the standard, and thus that means public health issues and, um, and impacts to our region's economy as well. Another look at the data. I'm not sure this is informative for, for you all tonight, but it, again, it illustrates that even when we, we can exclude values that we can't control, such as a wildfire impact or other, other measures that artificially or naturally boost our ozone concentrations, we have enough human uh, generated ozone that it doesn't matter. We can kick out a few values, but we're still in non-compliance. So those smoky, hazy days, those are a problem for air quality, of course, but we're allowed to exclude those from our, our calculations so we're not artificially being penalized for um, something we can't control. So we do have a problem and we, we need solutions. So this is just talking about um, various the standards and the planning requirements we have in place. What I'd like to um, indicate before I go there is that, um, and I wish we had the graphic here, but we're not alone. There are um, many cities across the nation that are just barely coming into compliance with the older standard or that um, are still out of compliance and are getting bumped up to a higher classification. When you don't attain an ozone standard on time, you're then EPA then bumps you to the next highest classification, a more severe classification that requires a new plan, tougher control measures, a little bit more time to comply, but you're at the risk of, um, of losing federal highway dollars. If you don't submit plans that are appropriate, you're at risks of, of not permitting industrial facilities that want to locate in the area. The growth um, that we depend on for our, our economy and, the, and, and employment, that, that can be jeopardized. And so it's important that we work together to develop strategies that get us to the right place. So this talks about getting um, you know, a timeline for what we have to do. We have um, a, a plan that we have to put in place and, and make progress just in a few short years. 2020 is when we have to show compliance with the serious area requirements. Right now, we're a moderate area, and we're going to get bumped up to serious because we failed to attain. But it's only three more years to attain, and we're already in year um, beginning in the year two. So we've got to get these control measures developed. We've got to get them put in front of the Air Quality Control Commission and other organizations to adopt, to implement, and make progress. Um, the new standard. Again, we're not alone with the old standard in complying. We're, we have company with the new tougher standard. So we have the big urban areas across the nation 
and uh, much of California that just can't comply with the 70 parts per billion newer standard. So that requires a plan too. So we have two ozone standards, two plans to do. Thankfully, they're on the same planning horizon and we can marshal our resources and develop what I hope is one good ozone plan that has good control strategies, that takes into account factors that we may not have um, significant control over, but that we make the progress that we need to get those values below 75 and get those values below 70 and improve public health, attain the standards, and then move forward. So we have just both standards uh, all in line here. It's likely that we won't attain either of these standards in just two short years. You saw the numbers there, 79-ish at, at, at the higher locations. We got to get to 75 and then to 70 in just two years. So we'll likely get another bump up for both standards to the next classification. And I don't want to be on this uh, treadmill three years from now and then three more years from now coming back to you saying we still didn't make it. I want us as an organization and as a region to make <coughs> necessary um, changes and commitments that we have to make to get us into attainment of the ozone standards as quickly as possible, but by this 2023 deadline for sure. It's, it's not realistic to assume we're going to get there by 2020, although that the, the losses we need to. We'll, we'll just have to get bumped up one more time, but we have to do the work now to get measures in place to reduce emissions in just um, five or six short years. So what do we do next? Um, we have all that, uh, those, those dates we've got to comply with, but we have to begin work doing the technical analyses that predict the future. What will ozone look like two, three, four, five, six, ten years from now? So we develop emission inventories. We have a contractor that takes all of the, the local data, including all the good transportation data that comes out of Dr. Cog, and predicts ozone in the past, in the present, and the future. Make sure those models predict properly, and then we can roll forward into the future to see where we're at. And then we can do one it, what if scenarios to say, what if we reduced mobile source emissions by X amount? Will that make progress? What if we reduce oil and gas emissions by another percentage? What if we reduce industrial emissions or or have different fuel formulations. What if we do different things? What will the benefits be? And so then we, we have an idea of what works and what won't work and how much they will work. And then we have to analyze the strategy. So we have a few listed here. There's, there's a whole bunch more in front of our committees coming up here in the next few months that we'll begin to tackle. But we'll be looking at zero emission vehicles, low emission vehicle standards. Those were just adopted by the Air Quality Control Commission. But we, when we go to a ZEB program, more electric vehicles on the street, how will that help us? Different fuel formulations, both gasoline and diesel. Looking at lawn, lawn and garden equipment, that's a big source too. All of us mowing our grass and trimming our, our, uh, our yards throughout the summer, just you know, ripe emissions that readily form ozone looking at um, all of the chemicals that we use in our society at the commercial level and household products, looking at standards to go to a cl cleaner formulations that form less ozone. Um, looking at all, all of our industries, oil and gas especially, because they're the biggest source of emissions at the current time in our region, but all the industrial facilities, taking a hard look at everyone, inviting them to the table, getting their input, asking them what the implementation issues are, how much does it cost, what is, what is the impact on your business? How can you contribute on a voluntary basis? It doesn't have to be through regulations every time. What can we do as a group, as a community, to make that progress we need to make? So now it's, um, again, the ask for money. It's, uh, we're not asking for new money, as, as Robert mentioned. We're just asking for an advance um, from one tip um, cycle, a future tip cycle, to our current tip cycle, so we can get that contractor on board, fully fund that effort so we get the good results we need going forward into 2019. And we can then assess those strategies appropriately with good science. And I think that covers my notes here. And um, again, I'm not Amanda, but if you have questions, you know, make her answer them. <laughs> yeah, call her. But uh, we're happy to take all your questions and provide input, meet with you individually or as communities. Part of my new job here <laughs> the lab. I came from the, um, the State Department of Health and Environment and from the EPA in, a, in you know, many, many years ago. But I'm, uh, I want to get to your communities. I want to talk to you all, find out what we can do for you, why we're important, and get your feedback to uh, give us new ideas and direction. So thank you very much. Now, there's a couple of things you can do. 
you can see more enforcement coming from EPA, but what can we as communities do? So I will ask every city and every county represented here at Dr. Cog to think about a couple of things. Conversion of mowers, whether they're your residential ones or your commercial, there's a program within the RAC to help you pay for those. Right now, uh, from the RAC board, we're trying to find some people to help us sponsor another opportunity for people to convert gas residential mowers to electric. This is a very steep discount for the cost of those mowers. But because we ran out of some funds in that program, we're having to reach out among the members of the RAC to try to find people to help. My city is going to provide the space for the collection. John Putnam and his group down there, they're going to pay for the trash haulers to bring the uh, dumpsters in. So we're starting to look at those. So if you've got any ideas of how your community might help, we're looking at multiple locations around the metro area to do that. Contact RAC and help them. You have an opportunity to put charging stations somewhere in your community. Luckily, I got one. We just uh, opened one up at City Hall, and there was the stupidest thing you ever saw come in there and hooked up to it. This guy brought a red vehicle, white leather interior. They call it a Tesla. But the goofiest thing looking about it was this standard front door. It's a four-door vehicle, standard front doors, but the two rear doors are a gold wing. And it looks like bat car coming out out of there when those wings come up and down. So all of you who want to compete for one of those, please put in the charging station. We'll try to get Tesla to bring you a car to show off your station. But just some simple things that we as community can do to help the problem. It's not going to solve it, but everything we do that can help to do it is going to be beneficial to all of us. So Mike and his team are ready to sit down with any group that's willing to talk to them, any opportunity to partake in the programs from fleet vehicles, being converted to electric. There's funding available for those programs. The charging station, there's programs there. The buyback of the gas mowers, the opportunity to go into commercial mowers for you to have park areas that are mowed by big gas mowers today, even down to blowers and weed trimmers. All of these options are there at the rack. It just takes people coming in and taking advantage of those opportunities. Uh, and I'm on the list of try every I'm trying to get something out of every fund they've got for our city. So I would tell you to reach out through your staff to the RAC, to, to Mike and his team, find out what you might qualify for, find out where you can get some reductions in the air quality that we're producing. We're not going to become an attainment state if we don't work on it. Any comments or questions for Mike uh, while we got him up here? Mr. Teeter. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just an information item. Commerce City and Suncor Refinery do offer a trade-in for your gas mower to electric motor once a year at Dick Sporting Goods. And that I'm not sure what those dates will be coming up here, but we do offer that. Good. Thank you. Ms. Shaw? Michael, please. Off. There, there we go. go. Okay, sorry. Um, wrong red light. <laughs> um, I, my question, I'm, I'm struggling to understand ozone. I know that we need it way up in the sky and we don't need it here. We don't have enough up in the sky. Is there a way to like pipe it up there? <laughs> we only wish. Um, you're, you're correct. It, it's, um, you know, it, it's good up high and bad down low. O ozone occurs naturally in our atmosphere, naturally in the stratosphere, and that natural ozone, you know, it forms and breaks down all the time, but it, there's, a, there's a fairly consistent uh, concentration historically, and that protects the Earth and all of us from ultraviolet radiation from the sun. Add chemicals that were uh, made for, for many good reasons, whether it's fire retardants or plastics or... Um, you name it, uh, CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, um, were found to be so excellent, they never broke down until they wafted up into that stratosphere and that intense radiation actually broke them apart and now they were free to gobble up that ozone. So the, there's, there's international treaties that, have, that are working to solve that problem and, and thankfully I think we're seeing better and better numbers in the stratosphere. We make ozone down, down low. It's, it's 
Ozone is a, what's called a photochemical pollutant. Different um, chemicals that we emit, nitrogen oxides from vehicle co you know, uh, combustion of gasoline and fuels in other industrial facilities, and then organic compounds that are volatile that evaporate, such as gasoline or, or, de or exhaust from you know, tailpipes in oil and gas operations, go up in the atmosphere mixed with sunlight or, or impacted by sunlight to form ozone. And that's in, in, mostly in the hot summer months that, that that occurs. So we have to reduce our emissions to reduce that ozone down low. So, oh, and if it can break down up in the sky, mm -hmm. um, can we not like force it together with a couple of hydrogen molecules and make oxygen and water? I mean, it it seems like there's uh, the 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 progress that we're making, if any, is small. Right. And and it almost seems like we need some kind of earth-shattering idea. Well, it, 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 there really isn't. There's lots of, there's been great ideas about, you know, big fans in the foothills to blow it away. <laughs> that would help. Um, but it's not practical or reasonable. And the, this injection of chemicals into the environment to, you know, help either down low or up high, that is just the solution that begs another problem. It, usually there's a side effect. So climate change will exacerbate our ozone as it gets warmer we get more and you know higher temperatures we'll get higher ozone levels too so we're we're in a you know we're in a cycle that we have to get some you know some control over and it's through emission reductions and that's really the tried and true way of of attaining all those other air quality standards that we're in compliance with we reduce the emissions ozone is just really difficult Thank you. I, I appreciate all that uh, RAC does to, uh, you know, with the charging stations and the alternatives for all of our cities. You're welcome. Thank you. Mr. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, what are the potential consequences of not meeting the ozone standards beyond just a bump up? Eventually, we'll hit the end of the road. Uh, are there, there are threats to funding, things like that? What are, what are the consequences? Absolutely. Um, you know, think of, we've never gotten in a position where we've been sanctioned. There's been some threats because we failed to adopt a plan. EPA and the federal government is patient in that regard. If the state is making a good effort to solve a problem, you get leeway. But if a state throws up its hands and say, here, it's yours, EPA, you do it. Well, they got to sanction our money because they got to they gotta do all that technical work. So, so highway dollars is one sanction. That's only been deployed one time, I think, in the history of, of you know, the, the last 30 years in, in Atlanta. And they got the message and they developed a plan, they got their highway monies restored. Um, the industrial sector, that's really the, the, um, the one that's most impacted because the permit thresholds get lower and lower and the mandatory controls on any new um, uh, industry or commercial activity gets tougher and tougher. So businesses will say, we're not locating in your area. We, we, we can't afford to build this plant, or we don't want to build this plant, or we don't want to bring our employees into an area that has a high pollution situation. So they look at other opportunities for areas that are in, in good shape with air quality standards. So the threat of sanctions is there, and the, the you know, taking away highway monies. We're, we're not in a, in a situation that that's eminent, but it's always out there. But what we need to do is, do the work so we don't get the nasty gram from EPA to the governor. No governor wants that, that, hey, we're out of compliance. You're failing to do what you're required to do under federal law. And so thankfully, we're, we're, we make progress and we do what we need to do, but we need to continue doing more. Mr. Dick. Yes, now that the microphone is working, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I have some help to my right, to your left. Um, <clears throat> The fires that have, have decimated California and other places seem to provide us with a certain amount of smoke over here. Given the fact that we have this transient influence, what kind of mercy are we granted or what can we get mercy from the federal government in that regard? Yeah, uh, that's a great point. Uh, we are impacted by um, international transport of emissions of smoke from you know California or West Coast fires, even smoke in our, in our own state, we get that impact. Um, if we can document that that smoke caused the problem, 
we get a we can we exclude that data from the um, the calculations. That's a that's a gimme. That's not in our control. But if we were already above the standard and the smoke made us go even higher, we can we can ask for an adjustment of the value, but we can't exclude it because our own activities that same kind of weather and um, you know temperature regime that you know we, that gives us summertime ozone also you know enables the wildfire situation that dry hot stable not windy condition here in the state so we do have EPA does allow for and the Clean Air Act does allow for exemptions but you have to document it and show scientific evidence that that caused your problem you're welcome Mr. Elrod Yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay. I have two questions. Uh, the first question, in or you talked about reducing the level of emissions. To what extent do we need to reduce that? Is that 20%? Is it 50% to begin to get close to that um, metric? The second question is, you talked about um, one of the implications is um, uh, from, a, from a federal perspective that they would um, limit our ability, uh, permitting for industrial. Is there anything that has been done at the state level or is there something we could be doing at the local level from a policy perspective to implement some uh, a stricter standards um, to help us not get it to the federal government um, setting that for us? Right. Um, Colorado has adopted all mandatory measures that is required of an area like Denver or in the Front Range. Um, for ozone and other pollutants. So we're already at the, <clears throat> the minimum requirement. Colorado has gone beyond in money areas, especially in the oil and gas areas, to further and further reduce emissions from that sector. It's just such a big sector that there's still lots of leftover emissions. So there's um, assessments underway right now for what else can be done with the oil and gas industry. Excel is shuttering all its um, it's coal-fired plants. They have in the metro area all their plants are looking at closing all coal operations in Colorado over the next number of years. That will help us as well. You get less particulates, less NOx, going to gas, and eventually, you know, wind and solar. That's, that's their ultimate plan. So there are measures that go in front of the Air Quality Control Commission on a regular basis to further and further tighten up the, the standards for industry and commercial activities. We have a vehicle inspection and maintenance program. Everyone gets their car tested on a regular basis to get licensed. Make sure you're not a high emitting vehicle. That's, um, we have the, the most stringent program in the nation for vehicles. Um, we'll be looking at the fuels programs. Can we get cleaner, cleaner burning gasoline and diesel fuels to reduce emissions from the lawn and garden sector, from the auto sector, from the uh, construction sector, from airport um, operations? So a lot goes on. Um, that percent you, met, you, you mentioned, we don't know what that percent is. We basically, because ozone is, is this, it's the soup. And you, if you change one thing, sometimes it exacerbates the, the next. So you have to use these models and assessment tools to look at industry by industry, sector by sector, and say, will this strategy work versus a percent reduction? Because how do you make a percent come true? It's really tough. And there's lots of interest groups that push in one direction or the other direction either pro or con. So we have to have the economic impact analyses prepared for the, the strategies themselves. We have good programs in place, but there's more to do. I hope that answered your question. The <laughs> answer is do everything you can. Do everything we can, right. And on the climate front, it's, it's just it's the same thing. It's we have to look for ways to become more efficient, look for voluntary strategies, look for just wholesale changes in the way we live to reduce carbon emissions that will also reduce those emissions that cause ozone. Jones, I have about five of you in the queue right now. So All right, I'll be quick. And I, I, I could always ask you this at the RAC, since there's such a good representation of Dr. Cog members on the RAC. It's rather kind of funny how many of us do both. Um, since oil and gas is such a high percentage of the ozone precursor problem, I was wondering why there wasn't a movement to expand the non-attainment area to include all of Weld County, since it's the epicenter of drilling in our area. And, and the um, monitor that Boulder County's put up at Boulder Reservoir shows that 
the prevailing winds blow everything that's drilled in Weld County. Um, and, and, and that's why our, our monitors are, are doing so poorly. So I'm just curious about the boundary of the non-attainment area. Sure. Um, most of Weld County is in the non-attainment area and subject to all the controls. There is a sliver of Larimer and Weld on the Wyoming border um, that are out of the non-attainment area. And at the time the non-attainment boundary was drawn, it, those were undeveloped areas. The, the oil and gas development has you know, proceeded to encroach into that area. Um, it's not great compared to what we have in, in the non-attainment area, but it is, it is more. Thankfully, our regulations, most of them apply statewide. It's not just in the non-attainment area, but the Air Commission and the RAC will be looking at those strategies that are non-attainment specific to expand them either into that, that, those parts of Larimer and Weld that aren't in the non-attainment area or into areas that are, are shown to, to contribute to our problems. Mr. Vidum. Larry, Larry, turn the mic on. Uh, no? Now it is. Oh, there's light, <laughs> sound. There he is. Heavens to Murgatroyd. Um, there's a study that uh, the implications of the study is basically that electric cars for the foreseeable future will be a novelty because uh, if the majority of cars in a metro area like uh, Denver or Los Angeles, wherever, if the majority of those cars were uh, cars like Tesla's or a Nissan LEAF where the car was purely electric, then the amount of energy uh, produced would have to increase by a factor of 10. Okay, so no such in infrastructure exists and no such plans to increase the in infrastructure exist. The other uh, factor is that I think at 75, at the current moment, 75% of all the electric energy created in the United States comes from burning coal. So there's two different studies that say uh, driving a, an electric car actually increases the amount of pollution that's going into the atmosphere. So I think um, in, a, in a lot of cases, the, the political will and the scientific facts uh, do not necessarily agree. And I wonder if you have a, a comment on that. Sure, I do. Um, uh, the, you're, you're correct that the, the amount or the um, uh, the number of EVs in Colorado is very small. It's a very small percentage of our fleet of new, of new vehicle sales. The Air Commission will be considering a provision that ramps up our, uh, the EV, what's called the, um, the zero emission vehicle mandate. And that will be about a 10% of new vehicle sales have to be zero emission vehicles. That will be the goal to get to about 10%. And that's what California does and 13 other states. So Colorado will consider adopting such a program next year. That's part of the, uh, of the Department of Health and Environment's um, task to bring a proposal to the Air Commission by um, spring of, of 2019. In Colorado, um, and especially in our Front Range area, we have um, a, a utility that's um, committed to zeroing out its coal burning um, generation. So we have. Uh, in, in our front range here, unless electricity is imported in, we have electricity that can approach 50, 60 percent renewable. So it's not relying on, on coal and the coal and natural gas component will continue to go down year after year after year. So as, as the new vehicles come in, there'll be cleaner burning or, or excuse me, lower carbon electricity generation to feed those, that EV system. Uh, what we also have and what the RAC does, what the Energy Office is doing, is seeding the, um, the region with electric vehicle charging stations. So we'll have that infrastructure in place. So if you don't charge up at home or you're, you're traveling across the state, you'll be able to find on your phone, hey, where is my, where's my closest charging station? And you could take advantage of that. Western Colorado utilities are opting, to, are opting out of Tri-State, for example, which is a, a heavy coal utility. Everyone has a, either a 20 or 30% renewable mandate in Colorado. We're unique in, in this part of the nation. But even Tri-State is seeing the writing on the wall, and they're looking to boost their renewables as well. And, and Holy Cross Utilities and others, are, they're wanting to go 100% uh, carbon-free um, electricity. So I, this is, a, this is transforma excuse me, transformational. It's not going to happen overnight. It's a 20, 30-year generational thing. So in the meantime, we have to look at the vehicles that we have, the gasoline and diesel vehicles, and figure out how to keep them clean 
and reduce their emissions as we're going down a new path. Hello, there it is. Um, you know, it's really nice that we have the ability to uh, deduct the foreign uh, uh, pollution that's coming in from California and elsewhere, but of course the people who live and work here don't have the liberty of not breathing that exactly. regardless. <clears throat> so you mentioned Atlanta, and I'm curious, and you've probably already done this and I'm just not familiar with it, when they were threatened with the sanctions and actually had them imposed, what did they do that we might not have tried that got them in compliance, and can we learn from them and implement some of those things? might not be available to us here at Elevation, but... Sure. I, I think what Atlanta did, and this, this is a case that goes back, it's, it's probably 20 years now. So they, it was, they weren't doing hardly anything, and they got the message that they had to adopt what everyone else was adopting in the late 80s, early 90s. And, um, or excuse me, or the late 90s, early 2000s. So that's how they solved that problem. But they went to the, the cleanest burning gasolines that, that are required, and we don't have that here. We have a higher, um, more polluting gasoline standard in Colorado than they have in Atlanta. Atlanta was forced into, under the Clean Air Act, the most stringent gasoline requirements. They've attained the standard. They've actually made it, and now they're able to relax their gasoline standards in the, for the summer months ever so slightly to accommodate you know, the local condition and still attain. So that's on my radar and that's on a lot of our radars is the gasoline that is provided to us by the Suncor refinery and by all those outside gasoline providers. We're, we're taking a hard look at that. We have a contracted fuel study that we're getting the results of now to see what are the cost benefits implementation issues of going to a lower volatility gasoline and what that will mean and how that will help us. We are impacted in a, in a greater degree because of our elevation to this global ozone background. And that's different. It's lower than the stratospheric ozone, but it is at ground level. And so Colorado, the western states, have a higher background concentration for a number of reasons. And it's whether it's Chinese emissions coming over or it's you know, our emissions polluted Europe, and Europe's emissions polluted Africa, and, Af and you know, it's, it's a global issue. And so we can't just say, well, China's doing this to us, you know, raise our hands. We have to do what we have to do, and then demonstrate, if appropriately, that, hey, there is impact from outside regions, wildfires, international emissions that we can sort of take credit for or not be held responsible for mitigation of. But we have, we have to do everything we can, as was mentioned earlier, to reduce our share. Ms. Abel? I have my technical support here with me. <laughs> so my question kind of stems around um, other states. And do you have a figure on how many states are in attainment? And are they in certain parts of the country? Or is it just sporadic? Because you, 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 know, you mentioned a lot about you know, the lawn and garden equipment and stuff like that. I mean, I only mow my lawn like four months out of the year. And in California, I would assume you'd do it every you know, 12 months out of the year in Florida and that type of thing. And I, I just, I, to me, to, you know, I know we have to do everything, but that seems like a minor thing in Colorado that wouldn't change a whole lot of. Sure. Our ozone problem is a summertime problem. It's not a wintertime problem. Okay. So we don't, you know, because we have cold temperatures, lower sun angle, less ultraviolet radiation, um, we don't get ozone in the colder months most of the time. There's a few sure. spikes sure. once in a while. Sure. But it's a, it's a summertime problem. And it's a summertime problem almost everywhere. You can see Florida, I think they're just blessed with, you know, uh, great sea breezes that, yeah, that, that disperse and blow it away. I mean, if we don't, we get temperature inversions, we get high pressure systems that trap those concentrations close to the ground, sure. hot stagnant days without those afternoon thunderstorms, uh, you know, an, after, an afternoon thunderstorm solves the problem for that day. Cuts well, off our, the sunlight. Our topography and plays to, a huge, topo and yeah, but oh, we, huge role. But we don't, get a, we don't get a gimme for no. topography, and nor does, and other states have other issues because of their topography sure. or their situation. Sure. So this is the map of what the, the, the newest standard, these are the non-attainment areas for mm -hmm. the 2015 ozone standard, 
And it's very similar, a little bit different for the uh, 2008 standard, but pretty close. So the ones in purple are the non-attainment. Non-attainment. So most of the country. Yeah, they have. There's problems. All, the, all the flat areas. The bigger <laughs> urban areas. It's yeah. really the the issue. Okay. Thank you. Other questions or comments from Mike before we try not to roast him too much. Yeah, this is great. Thank you. Just uh, everyone is aware, this was uh, presented to the RAC meeting. Uh, the RAC approved this motion. Let me read the motion to you as we would like you to consider it. We'd like you to consider the approving adding 125,000 of STP Metro in FY 2019 to the TIP project 2016-058, reducing the total set aside funds for air quality modeling in FY 2020 in the draft 2020-2023 TIP by the same amount. Again, this is borrowing money from the future to now in order to start the studies. I'm so move. All right, Mr. Brockett has made the motion. Do I have a second? Second. We have a second. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion, aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing no, the motion is carried. Mike, go we'll spend some money. Next item up is the policy on the state legislative issues. Mr. Morrow and company. Thank you, Mr. Chair and directors. Um, I'm going to spare our lobbyists in the interest of time unless you definitely want to hear from them. Uh, they'd be happy to speak, but I will introduce uh, Ed Bowditch and Jennifer Castle. I know many of you already know them. Uh, some of you are newer. Uh, we've been happy to have them again uh, lobbying for us at the state capitol this, this coming year. We've already been busy since January or uh, November, as you might uh, suspect. And so um, we'll have them uh, give a preview uh, of the legislative session at our January meeting. Uh, and before I start, uh, Jerry Stiegel asked me to call out my holiday tie, which is exactly the, which is exactly the same as his holiday tie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you anyway. wear it better. <laughs> we'll work on you next year, Jerry. You guys left somebody out of that uh, fancy tie thing. This one up here is not near as good as yours. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so this agenda item is a continuation uh, of an item from the November board meeting uh, presentation of the uh, uh, policy statement on state legislative issues. And um, we had presented it for consideration uh, last month. And it's back on the agenda this month for, um, for action. So and um, had, had not heard any comments or concerns or suggested for changes in the last month since presenting it in November. Uh, so in, uh, I would just offer that uh, in, uh, if there are any comments or questions, uh, or suggested changes to the policy statement. We could tr try to consider those tonight. Otherwise, um, I would uh, entertain a motion, hopefully for uh, approval. We use this every year to uh, guide uh, staff and lobbyists on our, our work down at the Capitol, particularly uh, in those times in between board meetings. Uh, as you will see, uh, once again, Starting with our January board meeting, we'll have a, a substantive agenda item uh, every month through the session where uh, we'll have uh, bills uh, affecting Dr. Cog, Dr. Cog programs, uh, the region, uh, to ask for your positions on those bills and staff will present some analysis. Um, you'll have a chance to, to uh, guide us on specific legislation, but having this policy in place also helps us uh, when we're down at the Capitol and also helps uh, inform uh, legislators and other state policy makers on, on, our, on our board's positions on general issues. So with that, uh, I'd uh, stop and see if there's any questions or a motion. All right, Mr. Rex, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just, just real quick clarification. There was, um, 
I just want to make sure this is clear. There were there were no suggested revisions to the policy statement on state right. legislative issues. There was one minor suggested change to the legislative policy statement, and that's the that's on page 47 in, in your in your packet, which is very minor. And uh, staff staff recommends we include that. And I would actually suggest a correction to the correction <laughs> before uh, before Director Jones suggests it to me. Uh, I was looking through the materials this afternoon again, and I noticed I misstated the correct name for CCAT. So it's really supposed to be uh, counties and commissioners instead of Colorado County. So we can make, I think we can make that correction. All right, open to the board. Any comments or questions? Chair? Hang on just a I second. recommend approval of... Hey, hang uh, on, I got people got questions before you go to the motion. Ms. Smith? Um, so I, I'm sorry, I wish I had submitted this in writing earlier. I'm wondering if on page 38, where you put consider alternative revenue and financing mechanisms such as VMT-based fees, um, if you could change that to road usage charge or in parentheses put road usage charge. We are in a consortium with 14 western states and that's the term called 14 states. VMT lends itself to that T being a tax, and so other states um, nationally have started going to road usage. That's a recommended uh, amendment to that? Uh, okay. If you want to just put in parentheses or replace VMT. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, uh, Deb, I think that's a, I mean, that's, that's a great point. I, I, I would actually prefer that we actually strike VMT-based fees and just use road users to charge. My recommendation. Okay, so we've got right now we have two changes from what was originally sent out. So, uh, Commissioner, if you want to make the motion with it as amended, that would be great, but not as it's presented. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I move we accept uh, these recommendations as amended. Okay. Is there a second to the motion? Yes, thank you, Ms. Maurer. We have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed? None. The motion is carried. Thank you very much, Mr. Rieger. Thank you. Tomorrow, sorry. I'm watching one page and reading off of another one. <laughs> I knew who was up next. Mr. Rieger. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Um, so this item concerns uh, federally required safety targets for 2019. So over the past year or so, um, we've had this conversation several times around uh, federally required uh, performance-based planning targets um, in several sort of categories that you see here. Um, so we have now, uh, at the end of this year, gone through all of these. Safety is, of all of these on the screen, safety is the one that we have to set targets every single year. Uh, the rest of these on the screen are more either two-year or four-year targets. Uh, but safety we do annually. So it was just about a year ago that we set 2018 safety targets. Uh, we're here tonight to set 2019 safety targets. When we talk about setting safety targets, um, the, the Federal Transportation Legislation, the FAST Act, requires us to actually set targets in these five areas. In the interest of time tonight, I'm not going to go through every single one of these, but I'll give you enough of a, a flavor of how we're, uh, what methodology we're using in the process to set the targets. Um, but just to go through these really briefly in terms of what we're required to set around, obviously, number of fatalities. Uh, fatalities, basically a rate of fatalities, uh, which is defined as you see here. Um, number of serious injuries, also a rate of serious injuries, again, as you see defined here. And then for non-motorized, meaning bicycle and pedestrian, um, a combined sort of target of um, fatalities and serious injuries. Uh, the geographic area in which this exercise applies to is the area that's in kind of orangish red on the screen. This is our MPO uh, transportation management area or transportation planning area. Uh, the areas in green um, are covered by uh, CDOT in their efforts to set safe, uh, statewide uh, safety targets. 
So this chart shows the targets that we set for 2018. Again, we did this just about a year ago. Um, for those that were on the board a year ago, we are not proposing to make any changes to our methodology or our process. We think it's, it's working well. Um, and as you see here, um, under the methodology column, we're doing a couple of things. The Metro Vision Plan, um, and I'll show you that in just a second as it applies to fatalities, we're using the performance target in Metro Vision, our Metro Vision Plan, as the basis for setting these safety targets. Um, on a couple of these where we don't have explicit Metro Vision guidance, we're using what we call hold the line methodology, which is exactly what it sounds like, which is, you know, can we hold the line on this particular uh, sort of category um, as our population increases uh, to, to at least not make things worse than, than they already are, so to speak, and start showing incremental improvement over time. I do want to say, frankly, from a moralistic perspective, we all know that the only really correct number that should be on the screen is zero. And I'm going to talk about in my last slide um, our efforts to start getting towards zero on traffic fatalities. But I at least wanted to show you where we're starting from for 2018 targets. So um, let's get into this just a little bit for fatalities. Um, I mentioned Metro Vision. We do have um, in our Metro Vision plan a performance target um, that the number of uh, annual fatalities in our region will be less than 100 by 2040. So we use that strategic planning guidance um, as our methodology to set um, targets or target for uh, fatalities. I'm not going to get into the numbers on this chart on the right except to say, I think we've got this here. So starting back in 2016, uh, the data that we had available, we say, what would it take to get to you know, less than 100 by 2040, and we kind of plotted that out year by year from 2016 through 2040 as a guide for us of that sort of incremental progress by year um, to be able to do that for fatalities. Um, so you see the number that's circled there um, is kind of where we're starting from for the target. That should say 242, um, kind of hard to see sideways. Um, so that was our target for 2018, and again, using that methodology of that incremental approach to get us to under 100. Um, and then you see um, over on the right the, fa the fatality rate. So the number on the left is the actual number. The one on the right is the rate. So um, as we go forward for 2019, um, and I guess let me make one thing clear. Um, part of this is prescribed by the FAST Act in terms of how we do this. This MetroVision approach, that's our approach. But we are required in terms of setting a target um, for all of these to be a rolling five-year average. So it's not a single number, it's a rolling five-year average. So for 2018 that we did last year, we were looking at 2014 through 2018. Obviously we had to estimate um, you know, a couple of those outer years. Um, as we get to 2019, we're going to have to do the same thing. Again, it's that rolling five-year average. This time we'll be looking at uh, 2015 through uh, 2019. So on that note, kind of progress towards uh, meeting our target. We don't know yet. We don't have all the data in. But how are we doing in terms of trying to reach uh, these targets? So the first couple set of numbers here that you see, sort of that prediction using that MetroVision plan approach, that incremental approach for 2017 um, for the fatalities on the far left where the check mark is, that 267. And you see we actually, uh, for 2017, uh, got to 264. So we did three better than that single year um, single year estimation. So when you look at it from our uh, five year, because again the target's based on a five year rolling average, um, you see the 224 over on the left um, and then the number on the right that, you know, so far we seem to be on track when it comes to fatalities. <coughs> Same thing for the rate over here on the right. <clears throat> So again, as we get into 2019, using that same methodology, let me go forward a little bit here on the animation. So we're proposing the number of 256. Again, same approach that we did last year, continuing on our course of year by year. And that 256 is, again, that rolling five-year average. And then you see the same exercise for the rate over on the side. Now, I do want to make one thing clear in the interest of transparency. Um, if you're good at math, you've realized that we went from 242 to 256 as our target. Well, why, why is that? Why would we want to have a higher target? Here's the reason. Again, I said it's a rolling five-year average. That's what the feds tell us to do. And I said last year for 2018, we were using 2014 to 2018. This year for 2019, we're using 2015 to 2019, right? So we drop off a year. As you see, I think that's 183 that we had last year. Well, this year, we we're kind of rolling that average, you know, one, one year later, so we lose that smaller number, that 183, 
and we gain a higher number of 252. So our rolling five-year average starts going up a little bit. Um, so I, I'm sorry for all the deep dive on the math, but the point there is that we know that's going to happen for a few years, but that's not, that's not a sort of lessening of the standard that we're trying to, trying to achieve here. Uh, we think that the policy basis of using MetroVision is the right way to do this. This is a quirk in the math, but if we continue on this strategy over time, we will still you know, be coming down to try and reach, reach our MetroVision target by 2040. Um, so as I said, I'm not going to go through the rest of these, but a somewhat similar exercise. These are, um, these are the targets that we're proposing, showing 2018 on the left uh, that we had last year, and then 2019 on the right. And actually, before I get here, let me come back and make um, a point here. Um, so a question you might have is, well, how are we doing this year? Um, looked at the data tonight before I came downstairs for the meeting uh, that CDOT compiles. Um, it's hard to tell yet until the rest of the year. Let's all hope that um, over the holidays that people drive carefully and that, they're, you know, that, that we're all responsible. Um, it looks like, though, that for 2018, it's going to be more or less about where we were in 2017, uh, which, again, was starting to see a little bit of a decrease. So let's hope that continues. Um, and then obviously we'll come back and report to you once we have the final data for 2018. The other question you might have is, well, what, what does this all mean? What happens if we don't meet our target? Well, as I've said, the good news is that it looks like, based on what we know so far, we are in progress to reach our target. But what if we don't? What happens? So I want to say that there's no financial implications uh, to us from the federal government. It's not that kind of exercise. Um, certainly they care about our planning process. They care about what we're doing here in terms of how we're looking at safety and setting our targets. Um, they've been pleased with this approach, so I think from a planning sort of process perspective, they've been happy with that. Um, but there are no financial implications to us for, for not meeting the targets. Having said that, um, I mentioned at the beginning, you know, how do we get towards zero? The targets I've been talking about tonight from the FAST Act and the federal requirements, as you've seen, these are very short-term targets. When we're talking about a five-year rolling average for those years, you know, we're kind of already done. Our, our ability to affect change is really about a year, and that's really hard to do. And the feds have told us that in this target setting exercise, you know, this is a very short term. It's frankly not aspirational. Um, they've told us not to be aspirational um, because of that short term time frame. Well, we want to do better than that. Um, you know, we, we do want to get to zero. Um, so in our, uh, in our transportation work program, we have a task to actually complete a regional Vision Zero action plan. We actually have an RFP on the street right now. It's actually going to be due this week uh, to hire a consultant firm to help us do that. Um, so in a regional Vision Zero action plan, obviously, we want to come up with um, ways to uh, reduce and hopefully eventually eliminate fatalities and serious injuries across the region. Really, we want this to be an education, information, and toolkit sort of exercise. I'll point you to the last bullet, policy, standard strategies uh, to encourage safety planning and design of the regional roadway system. So we want to see what you know, we as an organization, Dr. Cog, can do, but also how we can help all of you and all of our partners across the region do everything that we can. It's going to take a multi-pronged approach to get us towards zero. So with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Again, we're looking for a motion to adopt these 2019 Fast Act safety targets. I'll answer questions. Ms. Wynn, Ms. Shaw. Thank you. Um, my question is, where do those scooters fall, motorized or non-motorized? Um, we think that they would fall in the non-motorized category. Uh, we haven't had a scooter fatality yet. Okay. Um, hopefully we won't, right? Almost. But if, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But I avoided it. Yeah. Well, good. <laughs> <laughs> Riding it? No. <laughs> Other comments or questions? <laughs> Mr. Brockett. Just Thank you for that presentation. I'm glad to see the Dr. Cog moving forward with the Vision Zero plan. That's something the City of Boulder is trying to work pretty hard on. I know the City of Denver is as well. So I hope we can work together the different entities on combining strategies and techniques and things like that. So hopefully you'll be reaching out to our transportation department and working together. Yeah, absolutely, Director. In fact, I'm going to say that we will shamelessly steal as much as we can um, from both Boulder and Denver on the work that's already been done. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. What we want to do is take what have been city sort of Vision Zero Action plans and scale them up to the region. You know, what's appropriate, what's helpful for the entire region. So we will reach out, absolutely. Very good. We look forward to your ideas. Mr. Williams or Mr. Flint, do either of you have any idea of what the current status of Vision Zero is, as how you're progressing or how it's working? I haven't heard anything recently, so I'm just wondering if you think. 
I mean, I just have very general, you know, it's, we're, we're working on developing a plan right now. We're staffing up uh, specific Vision Zero staff and public works on there. Um, so it's, it's moving forward, but I'm sure I could get someone to come out and give a presentation to the board if that would be interesting to folks. Okay. Thank you, sir. Any other comments or questions? As Mr. Rieger uh, asked, uh, the recommendation is to adopt a resolution approving the proposed 2019 safety targets for the Dr. Cog Transportation Management Area as required by the FAST Act. Is there a motion? I have a so second. moved. Is there a second? I have a second. All those in favor, aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, motion is passed. Mr. Spots, I can give us another one, if you will. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hello again, Robert Spots. Um, I'm going to get debrief you on our 2017 annual report on traffic congestion. You all should have a copy in front of you. Uh, we'll briefly go over Dr. Cog's congestion program um, and kind of the main metric we look at, VMT growth. We'll look at uh, traffic congestion on some specific roadways. Then I'm going to hand it off to Steve Cook. He's going to handle the second part of the presentation of um, looking at recently completed projects in the region and um, kind of a glimpse at the future technologies and transportation. So this is something we are federally required to do, though I think Steve and I would probably do it even if we weren't federally required. We have such a good time with it. Um, it's, a, it's a report we've done since 2006. Um, one of the main things we do is look at how much people are traveling in the region. It's a very good metric for congestion. Um, you know, we're, the roadway system isn't growing fast enough to handle all the new traffic that's happening on it. Um, so we maintain a big database um, with characteristics of all the regional roadway um, system characteristics, traffic volumes, we update those every year, look at transit routes, how that's affecting. And then the results of this process can be used in, and have been used in TIP and RTP uh, planning. So every day in the Denver region, there are about 15 million person trips. That could be a trip you walking to your neighbor's house, or it could be a trip of a car driving the entire stretch of I-70 across the region. Every one of those counts as a trip. Um, about 2 million of those are done by pedestrian and bicycle modes. Uh, the other 13 million are motor vehicle trips. In motor vehicles. Um, so. Each one of those vehicles, on average, has about 1.4 people in it. Hence, there's about 9 million vehicle trips. Those vehicles, every day in the Denver region, drive about 83 million miles. Um, because of a limited capacity on our network, that results in about 250,000 hours or more of extra congestion delay experienced by residents and travelers throughout the Denver region. So there's that 83 million up there. Um, we estimate that from 2016 to 2017, VMT grew at about 2.5% or year over year, a 2.5% growth in VMT. So our VMT is rising as you can see the trend. We had a trend during um, the economic recession where VMT flattened for a long time. It looks like we're kind of returning to a trend of growth in the Denver region. You can see 2015 and 16 were really high levels of growth, back down to 2.5% this year in our best estimates. Um, as you know, one of our MetroVision goals is uh, to reduce VMT per capita. Um, unfortunately, in the last few years, VMT has increased at a faster rate than, v than uh, the population year over year. Hence, our VMT per capita has been slowly rising as well. So why is this happening? Um, you know, there's a lot of answers to this question. The main thing is we are growing incredibly fast. We have a booming economy. Um, as you can see in that graph there, our population and VMT are growing at about twice the national rate. More people, more travel all throughout the region. So examining congestion is, a, is an interesting, um, interesting thing to look at. It's been done in various ways through, over time. <coughs> the old methodology that people used was something like the Transportation uh, Institute of Texas. They would look at tube counters from around the region and kind of create a regional estimate of transportation. So looking at this graph, you might think that transportation kind of slowly rose until 2000 and kind of has leveled out since then. They stopped um, producing this data in 2014, mostly because there's great new data sources out there. Big data were provided as a source of data called INRICS from CDOT. Thank you very much, CDOT. 
um, which really uh, opens the door and gives us a lot more options and ways to examine uh, uh, congestion and traffic um, like never before. Um, looking at NRICS data, which uh, the farthest back we have since 2012, you could perform a similar analysis. You could look at the entire region and look at 24 hours a day. And again, you'd kind of come up with similar, similar results over the last uh, six years. You'd say speeds have only decreased by about 1% since 2012, a little dip. But then if you just look at, say, the PM peak, the worst time to travel during the day, you look at all the freeways, suddenly you see kind of a different picture starting to be painted. S the speeds have decreased about 7% since 2012. If you looked at the most congested roads in the region, during that PM peak, now you're looking at kind of severe um, congest, more severe congestion. We've seen speeds decrease about 18%. And classically, one of the worst seg segments of freeway in the region, the I-25 Central Corridor, based on the NRICS data, speeds in the PM peak have decreased there about 25% in the last six years. So that's looking at different geographies. Um, looking at different times of the day, if you remember, this is the most congested freeways. We said that decreased by about 18%. Looking at other times of the day, PM peak also down 14%. A really interesting one is the afternoon, this shoulder period. A lot of activity going on, shopping, picking up from school. Um, we've seen a really big uh, decrease. It's, all, it's about as dri bad driving um, on those freeways from 2 to 4 as it was, was during the AM peak hour just a couple years ago. The rest of the hour is also um, decreasing. But again, this is kind of to show you can, you can look at traffic in different areas, different specific segments, different times of day, and kind of come up with a different picture. To kind of capture that, what we do with our CMP is we, we analyze congestion using four different methodologies. We look at severity, so how bad is that worst hour? How bad does it get during the day compared to how it should operate in free flow conditions? Uh, the durations, so how many hours of the day are reaching that level of um, congestion? Um, magnitude is how many people are being affected by this. Is it a 200,000 person or vehicle a day freeway or is it a 10,000 um, vehicle a day uh, arterial? And finally, congestion is very reliable typically. You know if you drive on I-25 at 5 o'clock it's going to be congested. Unreliable congestion, aside from obviously all the safety concerns, um, can be the most frustrating and severe types of congestion. So we look at each segment, how often do crashes or incidents affect that roadway. We combine all those together and we create a point system or score for each segment in the entire um, region. Um, you'll find this map in the centerfold of your document there. The red lines in red are the roads that Dr. Cog gives a grade of D or F to um, in the current time, 2017. The ones in orange are what we expect to happen by 2040 to also be that level of congestion. So what we can do, and um, hopefully you've seen this before, you know, these are the things Dr. Cog helps out with. We have various strategies to avoid, adapt to, and alleviate it. Um, Steve's going to talk a little bit about that and more in uh, <coughs> just in the beginning. Of the week. That's off to him. Thank you, Robert. Uh, one thing new this year uh, that we added to the reports, we've been doing this report for about 10 years, one thing we added was a table with a lot of information about how some of our recent projects have performed. Um, this is through questions that you have raised in the past that the board has raised, and also uh, USDOT when they did our uh, certification review of Dr. Cog and the transportation planning process, said we needed to do more reporting on things that have been completed. Those of you and your uh, staff that have applied for projects, you know, know that you have to do a lot of work when you're applying for a project and predicting what the benefits are going to be. Well, now we finally put uh, information together uh, to help us analyze, well, how have these projects done? You know, which, which ones have done great? Which techniques have, yeah, have been good? We have a lot of types of projects uh, in our toolkit or our toolbox to address congestion uh, as, as one key thing. And so in the report, uh, is, is a table with a lot of information about categories of projects. And we looked at the last 10 years, so we kind of said of the projects that have been completed, so these are ones that have been completed in the last 10 years, what kind of benefits have we gotten? So we categorize them, we're not going to go through every single one, but we categorize them into our what we call our roadway management projects. This has been traffic signal timing services for many of your communities where we've done synchronization of the traffic lights to try to reduce the amount of idling 
and uh, stopped traffic. Uh, also, uh, high technology things, so things like a lot of the fiber that's been laid out there was through our uh, roadway active management programs. The second key item, the travel demand management or TDM programs that have been done uh, around the area. We had a, uh, also related to this is uh, the transit projects that we funded in your community, bus service expansion, fast tracks of course, and here's the TDM. Uh, the travel demand, transportation demand management, our way to go program that we work with a lot of your communities on and we work directly with and partner with the transportation management agent associations all, all across the region. So we've seen a lot of benefits from those. Bicycle and pedestrian projects that have been completed uh, over the last 10 years, over 40 new facilities, seven underpasses or overpasses that have been completed in many of the communities around, uh, around the area. That's the uh, Colorado uh, Station Bridge over I-25 uh, down there. So those are some categories. Other congestion, uh, major ones, uh, freeways and managed lanes, projects that have been completed on there. Many of you are familiar with these. We had the US 36 project opened up a couple years ago, managed lanes on North I-25, uh, the uh, lane balancing project down south on I-25 and, and I-225. Picture in your mind that, that's right, it wasn't that long ago that 225 was just four lanes going through the entire uh, uh, section of Aurora there. But a lot has been done in the last 10 years. Arterial street projects uh, have been completed uh, <coughs> along the area on arterials, new uh, interchanges, you know, arterial street types of interchanges uh, in Colfax, Parker and Arapahoe, Foothills Parkway uh, up in Boulder. Railroad grade separations, we've been able to complete three really key ones uh, in the last 10 years uh, with uh, Pecos Street, Peoria Street, as well as uh, the, the, the famous Wadsworth Boulevard uh, at the uh, railroad and Grandview Avenue there. That was really a key one, which was about nine and a half years ago, I think, that it opened, we looked at. So a lot's been done in the last 10 years, but you know, as some of the results uh, that we've seen, you know, even with the growth in the economy and growth in population and growth in driving with, with cheaper gas, uh, we still see a, a lot of congestion. Um, that's right, we have some pictures of some locations of, of these projects. So Paco Street, uh, at the bridge, those of you that may remember going through Adams County here north of Denver, and, and the old Google, the old Google aerial photo even had the train there, so it was like it was. <laughs> I, I did not Photoshop that in. That was actually the old uh, uh, Google Earth. So there it was, uh, you know, ten years ago. <coughs> or, oh, that was in uh, 2007, uh, and then here it is when it was under construction. If you remember, the road was actually closed down for a while. And there we had two trains in the Google Earth photo. Um, and then finally, the, the new bridge was built. Important thing with this, of course, uh, yeah, Bill's here from RTD, is that this really uh, uh, enabled uh, better utilization of the transit station there. Uh, and uh, and when, the, uh, when, when both rail lines open up, we'll really uh, see the benefits there. So that's the after project. Uh, this is, if you go onto Google Earth and you, know, you click on their historic aerial photos, they actually have going back to 1955, just a couple years before I was born. And here we are at Parker and Arapahoe. Uh, I think the only congestion there, I don't know if there's a cow walking across the, uh, the road there. <laughs> um, then we go to uh, 2005, and that's kind of what existed there for many, many years uh, with the congestion backups there. And then the final uh, project there. Now, in any of these projects, do we do we, you know we never think we're going to eliminate all congestion. Well, I guess maybe a railroad uh, overpass might eliminate it. There's there's going to be congestion in the region, but the data that we've seen has shown that there have been improvements uh, with the amount of delay. Uh, this is an example uh, underpass a pedestrian uh, underpass right by the right on the CU campus. Those of us that went there remember walking across this uh, many times back in our back in our college days. Or your daughter now uh, uh, 
and when it used you stepped across here and you'd be going from the uh, the, the uh, university uh, the union I still call it the union what was the actual memorial center and here's the new project where they did a really great uh, underpass and connections a little bit further to the south and not surprising pro not surprisingly uh, this is the uh, highest volume facility of all of the projects that we've completed in the last 10 years. We've actually gone out to all the bicycle pedestrian projects that we funded to those sites and we've done counts there. So at all 30 or 40 sites and no surprise, I mean we knew this before we funded the project that this would have uh, the highest level. Uh, other ones are like the Cherry Creek Path uh, in, in Denver. Um, this was a really great one uh, that was just completed in Aurora uh, where you, it's hard to see here, but there's a school in the top. There was a path along the left side there that you see going from the south to the north. But then they completed the diagonal there, right through the neighborhood, so children could walk to school in a much safer fashion. And way down in the bottom, did improvements um, at the at the crossing there on. I forget if that's Mississippi or Alameda. I can't remember. Is, is yeah, there's. Uh, um, so that that was that was a great project. We did a really quick analysis with our regional travel demand model and looked at uh, the accumulative uh, benefits of at least those road, the roadway projects that we list in the tables in here. And we're, we saw that close to uh, 19,000 person hours of delay was reduced because of those projects and about 6% less of the mileage that we travel uh, in the region less was in there was less severely, severely, severely congested conditions uh, associated with all those projects. We did look at one project, the uh, US 36 uh, BRT express lanes, and we looked at the, the big data, which Robert mentioned a couple minutes ago, the INRIX data. And this was his chart that he had up before of the whole sets of freeways and congested freeways in the area at different times of day. Whoops, wrong way. When we looked at there we go. When we looked at the U.S. 36 corridor, we've seen really dramatic uh, improvements in the peak period travel speeds, and that's for all users. So that's buses, that's everything, uh, using that U.S. 36 corridor there in just a matter of you know, two or three years. So we clearly saw a benefit there. Another thing that's presented in the report, and we're not going to go into a, you know, a lot of detail on this subject, is, is just the new technologies uh, that are out there. You've had present presentations on mobility choice and from CDOT on different things. But we go over a little bit of that uh, in the report, just talking about uh, adv advanced safe safety systems. And this really is the key thing. You know, that should be our number one thought with a lot of these new connected vehicle technologies and things. A lot of it's out there already today. Safety systems, uh, new travel modes, scooters, uh, mobility services that are out there with our smartphones, uh, travelers that are now able to make decisions with real-time information. You know, everyone in this room probably goes on to Google traffic or Waze or something at least once a week uh, just to confirm that the trip is going to be good, or you go on to Google uh, also for your transit information. You find when the next uh, bus is arriving, so you don't go out, go out there too early in the morning on a cold day. You can wait until you know that, oh, that bus is going to be here in two minutes, and it takes me two minutes to get there. I'll get there. Uh, two, th two terminologies that you hear a lot about. You know, one of them is connected vehicles or connected vehicle infrastructure. Uh, this one really is oriented towards safety. A lot of the things that are out there now in the vehicles uh, that are being advertised you know, during Christmas and holiday season, season with the safety improvements. But we're also going to have to do a lot more on our highways and our streets and our road system to make all of this work together. Um, automated vehicles, you know, this is the, the, the trickier high-tech one in terms of you know, what its impacts are going to be. We do know that there's just all these various things. I guess we got various up there three times. There's various levels of the human interaction and operation within autonomous, autonomous vehicles from a lot of human uh, influence in it to nothing. I mean, in one sense, the DIA 
uh, train out there that we all go on when we go from our gates back to the terminal is a, a type of auton autonomous vehicle. We won't mention the autonomous uh, uh, suitcase uh, uh, luggage system. Uh, <laughs> those who remember that from 25 years ago. Uh, there's various types of settings. You know, are these uh, uh, autonomous vehicles going to be in their own fixed guideways, like the DIA facility, or mixed with general purpose lanes? Um, types of services, will it be private vehicles? Will it be public vehicles? Will it be fleets? Will it be a type of transit service, potentially? Uh, just a lot, of, a lot of questions out there. And, and final slide, you know, some of the questions that are presented uh, in, in the report, so I won't go through each, through each of these, other than you know, the main goal of all is, is, is to improve mobility for people, for all people. Well, some of this improvement in mobility you know, may increase VMT, and hopefully there'll be more electric. So there's a lot of questions out there that we don't know everything right now. Um, we were asked this morning at a meeting, well, how are you modeling different? How are you doing things different? And we had to really be careful because a lot of some things are speculative. There's professional organizations out there where there'll be a room like this, and 30 people will say, oh, it's, this factor is going to go up. The other 30 people, no, this, fact, this thing's going to go down. So there's just a lot of debate out there. But we're working very closely with CDOT, RTD, Denver, all the communities around here, as you've heard in presentations over the last couple months. And with that, any questions for me or Robert on the uh, annual congestion report? I, I just had one caveat on your on your US 36 slide. I, I do think you have construction years included in the data, so that is a little bit misleading on that front. Other comments or questions? Jones? I was just going to say that it's really great to see project evaluation and outcomes. That's something we've been talking about ever since I've been on Dr. Cog, so I guess that's what, six years ago? Um, so it's really, I know, I'm so old. Uh, <laughs> but it's really, it's really helpful, and I hope, I hope as we look at success stories and figure out what's having the biggest bang for the buck on congestion, that that will help spur our creativity as we do our sub-regional tip form applications and that kind of thing so that we can learn from what we've done before. Mr. Flynn. Thank you, Steve. How much, uh, how much work is being done to build some redundancy and maybe some analog redundancy into to advancing te technologies that rely on interconnection? When I get a mild snowstorm and my direct TV goes out, I kind of worry about where my autonomous car is going to pick me up. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, seriously, but because we become so reliant uh, on that when the technology gets disconnected, what happens to an autonomous vehicle? What happens to other stuff? Boy, I mean, that's a, that's a hard one. Is Doug or Deborah? Is, is Bob, no, Bob's not here tonight, so he, he would know that too. Um, I hate to just say it, I don't really have a good answer right now, other than we're thinking. Right of. I know. <laughs> it, it's being thought of, obviously, and it's in when we talk about our, for every project, we need to do systems engineering beforehand. And that what that looks at, it isn't, isn't as much an engineering thing, but it, what it really means to me is think of every factor you can before you install something. Are you coordinating it well with your neighbor? Are you making sure that if you install technology X, if the community next to you has technology Y, is that OK? It might be. Maybe they can talk to each other. But if you have two different things that don't talk to each other, that can be, that can be a problem. The redundancy thing is, is tricky. I mean, the other one somewhat related, and I think we had it in one of the questions uh, that we're facing, too, is you know, the human who's operating that vehicle, whatever type of vehicle, even a scooter, I guess, um, will they become too comfortable with certain things and think, well, I can just sit back and, you know, I'll wait for the car to tell me when it's deviating from. And maybe this, maybe this means I can text more often because I don't have to pay attention as much. So there's just a lot of things we need to consider. The other term we use a lot is we need to be nimble. This stuff is changing you know, 
every week, every month, and that we need to be able to to plan for it. I don't know, Deborah, if you have anything from the CDOT perspective where you're really doing the building. Well, one thing I'd like to mention, I'm going to put a plug in for Mobility Choice, because it took a look at some of those scenarios like what if, you know, and do we want this technology to happen to us, or what can we do to actually make the technology work for us? So I, I'm just going to leave it at that, and the report will be. I know, I know it's an isolated. Go ahead. I know it's an isolated example, but the AGTS at, at the airport, the underground train, if it went down, if the automated gu guidance went down within five to ten minutes, there are a number of uh, Westinghouse. It's no longer Westinghouse. I forget who it is, but those workers would be down in the tunnel within five to ten minutes and manually pilot the trains. So, but that's a very discreet, isolated example. I'm, I'm very concerned about over reliance. So I always encourage folks to to try to build in. I keep calling it analog uh, backups rather than digital. All right, Ms. Zabo, you had a comment. I didn't have a comment. Okay. My thing is best here. On and off. Oh, was you and Roger whispering in each other down there, and we're trying to get it so it's yes. amplified. We were oh, talking yeah. about you, Mr. Chair. That's okay. <laughs> as long as you're talking about me, you're leaving Mr. Holland alone. But That's we'll go right. to Mr. Holland anyway. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I th this is a real concern, and um, I would just look as a, I'm a commercial pilot, looking to what aviation has done and how it's accomplished so much in in, uh, in autonomy in, in flight systems. The problem is, is uh, particularly the younger pilots are coming on 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 the airlines now. Uh, that's all they've known is is this reliance upon autopilots, upon uh, landing and takeoff systems, and and those things. That when they run into trouble, uh, they they have they don't have the flying skills anymore because they've lost them to recover aircraft. There've been several examples of crashes that occurred because of that over over reliance. So it's really an issue that we have to have to really guard against and make sure that there are appropriate redundancy and training to overcome these potential technological challenges. You know, one, I will remind us all of the uh, mobility choice program that we were all involved in over the last few months and uh, that will be wrapping up over the next few weeks and uh, what we're anticipating right now either in January probably more likely February we'll be getting a debrief on the results of mobility choice so I would encourage that whenever that's up on the agenda you make sure you and if you have a transportation person that's that you're really engaged with bring them down to the audience that night uh, because I think what we're going to get out of uh, the group on there, of what what are we going to do about transportation? What are we going to do about mobility as we move forward? And some of the things that are coming out of there are going to be, how are we going to pay for it? I think you will all be affected by that process alone of, of how we're going to pay for it. And CDOT doesn't have the money. Right, Deborah? Not now. Not now. <laughs> for November? Yeah. Steve, anything else? All right, you and Robert. Yes, Gabriel. Sorry. I, I would like just to give a kudos to staff. Um, I found, I hate the doomsday part of it, but I found um, the analysis and everything very fascinating. And I have one question that I actually had before I walked in here. I should have asked you before for now. But on, on this graphic, did you assume um, the long range plan improvements when you did the 2040 and you still came up with that? Or is it just based off of today? Yes, so it includes the long range. Okay, thank you. In fact, I learned some things and I thought, hmm, we're going to do this analysis statewide. So thank you very much. Well, again, thanks to the staff. Ms. Elrod, go ahead. Curiosity question uh, What's the impact of Uber and Lyft? Well, that's easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which, which answer do you want? <laughs> there, there are several studies going on about that. Um, one study out of San Francisco is it's coming to the conclusion that it's negatively affecting congestion pretty severely. Um, you know, these vehicles are kind of driving around without any real purpose while they're waiting to pick up passengers, and people are possibly substituting transit trips for Uber and Lyft. Um, Obviously, there's opportunities for carpooling on those services as well, and um, you know it's it's a very new thing, and a lot of research is being done on that. 
Other comments or questions on the presentation? All right, thank you, everyone. Move on to our committee reports. Ms. Jones, you got the stack? I was at the rack, so uh, Roger's going to report on the stack. All right, Mr. Thank Partridge. Thank you, Director Jones. <laughs> hey, uh, it's really most informational items, kind of prepping for what we're going to be seeing in the next year and the years to come. So informational briefings on low emission vehicle standards, quite a discussion on that and really kind of interesting when you look at Colorado and other states, which kind of goes in next one, the Colorado Mobility Performance Measures comparison to other states is also discussed. The 2045 statewide plan kickoff was presented and CDOT Smart Mobility Plan. And last we talked about rest areas, which was really, again, pretty robust discussion, the combination of them, creation of them in some areas, the expense of it, and the challenges with rest areas. So it's really pretty interesting. And uh, uh, Mr. Chair, if I may, um, uh, item C, uh, the MAC did not report, so you can skip item C. Okay, let's go to Ms. Warren. We did not have a meeting um, in December. Okay. Mr. Rex, you want to talk about the RAC? Yes, sir. Uh, the only action item at the RAC uh, this month was uh, approval of the work program and budget. Okay. Mr. Rakowski is not here. Anyone got the uh, E470? Roger or I got John? It. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, at E470, we, uh, we reviewed and approved our 2019 budget. Uh, we let out the construction management uh, contract for the road widening, the second phase. Uh, we had a couple of administrative or executive items. We had a, a third amended and restating establishing contract. What we did is we just brought our, ex our original contract up to uh, existing PHA state law. And uh, we had a conflict of interest as well as a project prioritization uh, resolution. Ben Meter. There's one hot topic regarding fast tracks at RTD, and that is RTD's submittal to the Federal Railroad Administration of the um, Crossing Warning Time Action Plan for the University of Colorado A-Line, the B-Line, and the G-Line. I won't go into the details, 73-some pages in that plan. And if you want to read it yourself, it is posted on RTD's CORA website. So you can do a search and read it yourself. I've skimmed it. I haven't read it myself. I can attempt to answer questions. But loss in that um, information and update um, has been the other piece of information regarding those lines that are in operation. And that is that the B line and the University of Colorado A line both are exceeding our ridership projections. Not by a lot, but by a safe amount. And to the point, actually, on the University of Colorado A line where in, in mid-January, we have entered into a contractual agreement with DTP to double the train length. So we will be doubling capacity on the University of Colorado on the University of Colorado A line come mid-January. So there is good news amidst the um, correspondence and other issues and challenges on the on that project that I wanted to share with the group tonight. A quick reminder, your next uh, board meeting is January the 16th, but before you all jump up and run out, on behalf of the executive committee and the Dr. Cog staff, we wish all of you a very prosperous and ho happy holiday. Please travel safely. We'd like to see you all back here next month. With that, we are adjourned. Have a fire impact. That went fast. Coming to Nada? I thought we were going to get out real early for one.